We are going to go straight to it because this session has a lot to cover. I know I say that every time, but I really mean it this time. So we have a lot to cover. So exactly what we're going to cover today is first carrier commissions, tracking, reconciliation, just some general best practices that we need to take um, advantage of. We're going to go over our brand new chargeback module, exactly the details of that, how it's going to work, how it's going to look. And then we're going to talk about some employee commissions. So the very first thing that we're going to talk about are some things that you absolutely must do in RQ4 as it relates to carrier commission tracking. So the very first thing that I want to talk about are a couple scenarios that people usually think that they cannot track in RQ4. So the very first one are ported numbers. So depending on your carrier or the scenario, you may uh, refer to ported numbers as, um, I don't something different, but what it is, is when you come over from another carrier and you want to keep your same phone number, so the carrier, uh, often they're referred to as temp numbers, so port number or temp number. The second scenario I want to talk about are cross upgrades. So what happens there is that specifically when you want to upgrade your phone, but you want to use someone else's credit, and then you want to do the ESN swap, and you need to do all of those different things. So uh, what both of those scenarios have is two different phone numbers, either our temp number and then our permanent number, or we have our phone number that we're using the credit on and then the phone number that we're actually keeping, okay? So we've got two phone numbers for these different scenarios. So what we wanna do is we wanna allow the port number in the phone activation wizard. So that's just a setting in your um, POS defaults, and what that's gonna do is when you go onto the phone activation wizard, it's going to give you two phone number options. So you'll notice there's a little port number checkbox there. So what it means is you go through the phone activation wizard, you type in your phone number. If you check that box off, it's gonna open up this other box that allows you to type in the port number or the temp number or the alternative number that you're actually upgrading on. So depending on what the scenario is, is um, you'll use it differently. Um, but both numbers will show up in the reconciliation screen, both numbers will show up in the vendor rebate history report. So basically you have the ability to track two phone numbers. So while we're on this screen, you may have noticed this field right here that I have labeled last four of SSN. So what a lot of people do today, and this is a good practice, is you're already tracking the last four of the social, but you're doing it through the SOC code field box. So that's been a really great workaround for you to ensure that you capture the last four of the social every time you do an activation, and then you know corporate office gets access to it at reconciliation. However, now we have the ability to track um, an extra field on the phone activation wizard, and you can label it whatever you want. So in this scenario, I labeled this extra field as last four of SSN. You can label it anything that you want, and you can force it to be a certain amount of characters. So how you do that is now in your vendor account setup, you'll have new options to require, we're just calling it an extra field on the phone activation wizard. So you enable that, then it will say, well, what do you want to name it, and how many characters should it be? And then, of course, this extra field is going to show up in the reconciliation screen, the vendor rebate history report, all the places that you would want it to be as it relates to carrier commission. So we all want to use that extra field for whatever makes most sense for you and what carrier you are. The other thing I want to talk about is um, price sheet promotions. So a lot of people have a um, lot of price sheet promotions going on. So before I go too far into it, a price sheet promotion, just in case you don't know, is a tool where it will allow you to track an extra piece of commission. So for Sprint, you would use them for overlays. Um, depending on the different carriers that you would use, um, they track, you know, if you get a specific spiff on a certain phone for a given time frame, um, volume bonuses, um, exclusivity bonuses, all the different extra pieces of commission that you track, you're probably doing it through a price sheet promotion today. So we don't always have to use price sheet promotions. There's this new column in the phone active, or price sheet, I guess, that says spiff skew. So I just want to explain what it means and how it can be used. So the spiff skew is essentially like tracking two hardware rebates or two um, phone commission skews, however you want to word that. So what's unique about it 
is that the price sheet today on your equipment rebate SKUs, you're forced to have one per term, but as you can see in this screenshot, I've only told the system to use a SPIF SKU in certain terms. So only on my two-year activations do I want this extra piece of commission track. So if you're ever getting an extra piece of commission on a two-year activation for a certain phone, whatever the case may be, you can set it up in here. So any AT&T people in the room, uh, WDs or NECs, you always get these two pieces of commission per phone. So this will let you track one piece on the equipment rebate SKU and one piece on the SPIF SKU. So what that does is if you put a SKU in that field, it just generates another column in the price sheet. Here's the price of our phone, here's our equipment rebate, just like you have today, and then you get a third column that says here's our SPIF SKU. So you don't have to do promotions for everything. Promotions are great, but you have to, you know, they're just really time consuming to set up if you have a lot of them. And this is great because you can open into Excel, bulk add the SPIF and bring it back in. So I just want to jump back to price sheet promotions because I still think they are extremely important that you're using them, but only for those really specific, you know, scenarios, this phone, this term, this rate plan. Uh, type of combination. Another thing that it's really good for is now it can track a negative value. So a lot of carriers will say Sprint specifically right now is charging back $35 on the equipment rebate. So you need to track that negative $35 in your commission. So carriers often have this, we're going to pay you more, but then we're going to charge you back just a little bit. So if you ever have a scenario where you need to track negative commission, now we have a quantity field here where we can go negative one. So what this means is instead of saying track this extra $15, it's going to sell it at a negative one and it's actually going to go minus $15. Does that make sense, hopefully? If not, we'll wait for questions. So here's a few settings that will really drastically change um, how you're interacting, the stores are interacting with the phone activation wizard and what that's doing to the back end. So the first one I want to talk about is force a customer to be attached when a phone goes through the phone activation wizard. We have to check this off. This one really shouldn't be an optional thing. Um, we do default it to not be checked off, um, allowing you to make that decision, but this is something that you really want to turn on. It will force you to not be able to tender a sale unless that sale is linked to a customer, and that's crucial for reconciliation. The next two are allow manual addition of phone activation wizard SKUs onto the invoice and allow additional uh, manual addition of promotion SKUs onto the invoice. You want to uncheck these. So why we want to uncheck these is because we don't want employees to have the ability to take SKUs from the phone activation wizard and add them onto an invoice. And so think about what SKUs the phone activation wizard are putting onto the invoice. Rate plans, rate plan commissions, and phone subsidies. In no scenario should an employee be able to just manually sell those out. And why we don't want them to sell them out is specifically around rate plans because they aren't worth anything, but you do report on them. So we don't want any ability for any numbers to get skewed. We don't want employees to open it up and sell a bunch of rate plans to make it look like they're selling more than they actually are. So this will completely eliminate the ability to do that. So if you're reporting on your rate plans, you're guaranteeing that those rate plans went through the phone activation wizard. These two settings default to being checked off, so you actually want to go and uncheck them. So as I was practicing this earlier, I thought I'm going to say, guess what 80% of you don't use, but how would you know because you're not using it? So I was thinking like, how can I reword that? But I just thought I would say, guess what 80% of you don't use? You don't know. <laughs> oh gosh, if it was reconciliation, we I don't know if I could be here. <laughs> the invoice editor. So let's go into what is the invoice editor for the 80% of you that don't use it. And then for the 20% of you that do, we've got some fantastic enhancements to it. So the first thing, what is the invoice editor? I'm just going to say it. It's not going to edit an invoice. We named this completely wrong, so no editing. However, what it really should be called is invoice automatic refund and resell in the right location as the right employee on the original sales date. 
And that's what it should be called. Because what it does is, <laughs> what it does is it will actually, this is meant obviously um, for corporate office only. So I'm at the corporate office, I go into the invoice editor, I find an activation that a store did, I can say, okay, this phone that you said was on a two-year activation on a really high rate plan was actually on a two-year activation on a really low rate plan, and I'm going to change the features that you put on because you put the wrong ones on. And then I hit save. What this invoice editor does is it will actually basically assume that you're logged into the original store. It will refund the original sale that the employee did. It will resell the correct criteria, and it will do it on the original date of the sale. So to date, it's been very important that you're doing this very timely. You don't want to go back and edit anything that is you know, a month or three months old because you've already closed your books by then. So this is supposed to be audit really fast. So what's new in the invoice editor? So here's for the 20% of you that use it and the 80% of you that will likely start to use it. Uh, here's what's new. The first thing that's new is we can edit, we can see comments that are on the invoice and we can change them. So you can change any comments that you want on here. And so on the new sale that this creates, these new comments you put on here will be on that new sale. The other thing that's new is all of those extra fields on the phone activation wizard. So the SOC code, this extra fields, contract number. Depending on what you're using those for, this will allow you to edit them um, as you're going through the process. So another thing that's new to the invoice editor that I'm going to give four out of five stars, in my own personal opinion, is the abil uh, ability to change the date that this new invoice is created on. So as of today, prior to this new enhancement, when you edited an invoice, it was always on the original sales date. So like I said, you'd have to have a very tight window of when you were auditing your invoices and you know, refunding them and reselling them so you weren't editing anything too old. But now, let's say you do have scenarios, which we all will have, where you need to edit something that was you know, three months old. And you don't want to have it hit your books three months ago, so now you can change the date to today's date. So you'll have that option every time you change one. So the other thing that's new on the invoice editor that I'm very, very, very excited about, five stars. This is, I don't give out five stars very often, but this is definitely going to give five stars, is the, avail or the ability to go through and refund and resell to a different employee. So that one is very good. So the XML import is something that is new. Well, we've always had XML import where you could take an XML and we could read the XML and we could bring it in. Anyone who's using that today, all it will do is it will create the customer for you, it will start the sale, and it will populate the ESN and phone number. And that's fantastic and that's very good. So what is an XML if any of you guys don't use it? An XML is provided by certain carriers only, unfortunately. And it is a file that will give you contact information of the customer, so first name, last name, um, their address, phone number, all of that. The specific rate plan that they got through the carrier's activation site, any features that they got, the IMEI that was activated, and of course the phone number that was activated. So we take um, that XML and now we can bring it into RQ4. So if you're not bringing it into RQ4, here's what your flow looks like today at the store. So it's 10 different steps for the employee to get um, from the carrier's activation site into a finished RQ4 sale. So it goes like this. I activate a phone, I open RQ4 and I create my customer, I start my invoice, I scan in my ESN, I choose my term, I choose my rate plan, I enter in the phone number, I add my features, I add my accessories, and I tender my sale. So those are all the things that the employee does as they're going through the sale. So of those 10, these are all of the ones that they could potentially enter in wrong. They can type in the wrong phone number, they can type in the wrong ESN, they can add the wrong features, they can choose the wrong rate plans, all of those things. Um, but these are all the things that we want to be obviously very accurate for reconciliation purposes. 
So if we take the XML that the carrier provides, here's what the flow will change to. We activate the phone, we import the XML into RQ4, we add our accessories, we tender the sale, and that's it. So specifically, let's go into the details of exactly how that works. So we open up RQ4, we click on our carrier activation, our carrier widget, we choose which carrier we are. If you only have one carrier, you won't even see the screen, it just knows. It will say, find that XML. So why you have to find that XML is when you download it from the carrier, it goes onto the computer. At this point, when I import it, just so everyone knows, it's gonna delete it off the computer. So it's only on the computer um, from download time to upload time. So we find our XML and we press import. And it's gonna say, successful import. Here's the customer, here's their contact information. What do you wanna do next? So in this case, we would just wanna jump straight to a sale because 99% of the time, that's what you're gonna to wanna to do. So we wanna to jump to the sale. And I don't know if you can tell from the screenshot, but everything's grayed out. So what did the XML automatically populate? Phone number, term, and term length. We have our rate plan, and if you notice, there's a specific SOC code there, bill code. SOC code and bill code are the same thing, depending on what carrier you are. And our phone number. So think about all those red spots where we could manually put in the wrong thing. This brings in everything and auto fills it. So if you enable it and you want to allow employees to do so, they can manually override what the XML brought in. So if for some reason that makes sense, and I haven't even figured out a valid you know, example to even say here, but if for whatever reason you need to override what is brought in, you can override it, in which case you are going to be prompted to say, why are you doing that? And when you say you choose your reason why you're doing it, it's gonna produce a report that says, here's every time someone changed what the XML brought on or brought in. So then the next thing, so we went through the phone activation wizard, it filled in our rate plan, our phone, our ESN, our SOC code, our term, everything. So what does anyone notice on this screenshot? It brought in our features. So the features get brought in if they're in the XML. So um, I'm gonna go into exactly how it works and the details on how we set it up to have it auto-populate. But as long as you have it set up that the XML is saying, here's feature one, two, three, and we have feature one, two, three, it's gonna automatically add all of the features. So the employee literally just has to add on the accessories. So let's assume we have this set up and we're expecting our employees to always bring in the XML and then all of a sudden, for whatever reason, they don't bring in the XML and they just wanna sell a phone manually. So if they try to sell a phone that launches the phone activation wizard, and it's not through the XML, they're gonna get another pop-up that says, why are you doing this manually? And you choose, these are customized reason codes again that they have to choose from, they have to enter in comments. So you've got these two different reason codes. Why did you override and change what it brought in? Or why did you skip going automated and do the manual route? Regardless of which way you did, we have a new phone activation wizard exceptions report. So this is gonna identify every single invoice where the employee went either manual or edited what was automatically brought in. So this will become the perfect, in, perfect report to subtotal by location or by employee, see who's really the ones who are you know, uh, trying to cheat the system or you know, change any of the criteria that automatically gets brought in. So probably the big question on everyone's mind is, how does that even work? How do you know how to take that bill code or that SOC code and have it auto fill in all of this stuff? So we have this SOC sheet. So the SOC sheet, when we created it, we designed it and mimicked it to be as similar as we could be to the price sheet. So if you think about your price sheet, we've got uh, this location, these phones, this availability, things like that. This works the exact same. You can copy them, you can import export from Excel, those type of same functionalities as the price sheet. And we did that so the learning curve would be minimal. So here's the column that makes it all happen. Sock code column. So these are all of the socks that your carrier has. 
And remember, SOC is bill code. See, these are all the different specific rate plans. And the column beside it is the description, which isn't mandatory, but it's really nice because you have generic plans in RQ4, a SOC is triggering a detailed description, which will then print on the invoice. So you kind of get best of both. So a question that comes up often at this screen is, how would you expect me to enter in all of those SOCs because my carrier has, you know, a thousand different SOCs that they have between the grandfathered plans and, you know, all of the different plans that exist. So one thing that this sheet does that's completely different than what you're used to is we map to them as opposed to you mapping to us. So what I mean by that is if you think about how our exports, imports work today, we give you a price sheet, for example. You export that price sheet into Excel, which is our template. You fill in our template, and you import in our template. So we give you the bones, you fill it in, you bring it in. So this one will work backwards than that, because how we would never know how many rows and columns to you know, fill in the skeleton. So how this works is you just have your Excel sheet uh, with all of the bill codes or SOC codes that Carrier has, and you tell the system, here's my SOC code column, here's my term column, rate plan, create, and we'll generate all of the appropriate rows. So it works backwards than the regular import export does. So here's exactly how it works. So we have the XML that has a single SOC. This is the rate plan that you activated. We find that SOC in our SOC sheet, and then we say, okay, well, that SOC was linked to a two-year activation. That's how we populate the two-year activation, and we know that that's a new activation. And then we say, okay, well, that SOC is a two-year activation on this plan in RQ4. So that's how we map new activation, two-year, this generic plan, or even if you use detailed plans, it will totally work. So this rate plan, this everything, and that's how this one SOC code drives that whole phone activation wizard. So I'm sure it's one thing for me to stand up here and be like, this is great, it's gonna work, it's gonna populate everything. So uh, I just wanna show you really quickly a conversation I had with one of our customers, RJ Wireless, who's an AT&T dealer out of New York. So I was telling them yesterday when I saw them, I was gonna ask them for a quote and say, hey, could you give me a quote for using the XML and how well it's worked for you? But then I decided that I didn't need a quote and I just went into my emails because on the day that they started using it, I was emailing back and forth with Reddy, who's the one uh, from RJ, who is the mastermind behind it all. So this is how the conversation went. I said, hey, how did that XML import go? And I'm talking about the import of all the socks or bill codes up into RQ4 and he said, I just imported 400 line items, it works like a piece of cake, it is really an amazing tool. And this is copy paste from my email. And then I was so excited, that's so great, keep us in the loop on how the stores like it. And this was probably my favorite email I've gotten in like the last six months. Because he said, oh, it's so beautiful. Most of our fraud is coming out. Sales reps are hating it because they always choose the wrong rate plan for commissions. And now it's completely under control. So then I had to tell him that I was so happy. He's my favorite person but now I'm gonna have to show this email at the summit, which of course, he was so sweet and said I could. So, I'm gonna get past tracking commissions and I wanna go into the wonderful new chargeback module, which I'm very, very excited about. So first, I just wanna you know, explain why we did the chargeback module. So I think it's pretty straightforward enough if I were to say that it means we don't have to refund our chargebacks anymore and I didn't think I needed a screenshot, I didn't think I needed to really visualize why we don't wanna do refunds, but I will explain really quickly, the reason we don't want to refund our chargebacks is because they will look like a negative quantity today. And that's a problem because if you did 100 activations this month, and then you refunded 20 today because you got charged back, our system's gonna reflect net 80 activations. While that's technically true overall, you still did 100 activations this month. So how are you gonna trend and look at your numbers and know how many activations you're doing if we're constantly netting them out with a refund? 
So no more refunding of chargebacks. We're going to stop that immediately. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to stop using the penny workaround. Yes, that's a good one. So the penny workaround is we don't want to refund for the you know, reason I just said, but instead what we will do is we'll take away the whole value of the line item. It's $100, we're getting charged back $100, we don't want to refund it, so let's change it to a penny. So we're going to see that loss in revenue, so our overall gross profit will look right, we're not affecting our current new activations, but reporting around it is difficult, and you still don't have the, you know, enough visibility into why are you being charged back, um, how much per employee, per location. So we're going to stop doing the penny workaround immediately as well. So this is how it's going to work. We're in the reconciliation module. We right click, and just like how you probably all know today, you can right click and you can refund, or you can highlight a bunch of line items and you can change them to a penny. We have this new full chargeback option. So how this is going to work, as far as employee commission goes, is exactly like a refund. You sell it, you get commission, you charge it back, you lose the commission. So the, the employee commission should just naturally continue as is. If you're changing it to a penny or you're refunding it, this is just going to continue to take the full commission away. So we choose full chargeback. You can enter notes. You can set up your own reason codes. So the reason codes will be what you want to report on after the fact in the new chargeback reporting. So whatever your reasons are for chargebacks, if you have a way to identify why you're charging an item back, then you can classify that in here so that when you report, you have that much more detail. So you customize and set up all of the reason codes. So what a chargeback does is it will give you a new transaction type. So now we will have multiple transaction types. We obviously have a, an invoice and a refund, and now we'll have a chargeback as a transaction type. So this is going to be um, a list of every line item that was charged back on that um, specific transaction that you did. So what you're noticing is that it's showing me vendor rebate values on here, and that's brand new. Nowhere in RQ4 today can you see on a printed piece of paper, invoice-wise, what the amount of a receivable was from the carrier. So when you do a chargeback, this new transaction type will actually show you the value of a transaction that was charged back. This is intended strictly for corporate office. So for head office needs to type in a chargeback number, they know that they got charged back $403. There is security around this that employees, if they were to click open one of these, that it will show zero or that they can't even open it at all. So don't worry that you're going to expose any numbers to anyone because that's not even an option. It's completely security driven. So reporting around chargebacks um, is going to be very good and very detailed. So we have a new chargeback report. It's a, a tabbed report again. So we can go by reason code. We can go by uh, location, employee, overall, depending on what you're looking for. Uh, it will show you quantity, it will show you the value of chargeback, and what's really cool about the reporting is the date options that you have. So depending on how you view uh, chargebacks and how you'd want to look at what's the value that I got charged back, your options are going to be, do I want to look at all of the chargebacks that I processed this month? So if I processed, you know, $50,000 in chargebacks in October, and they were from the last six months, if that's how you view it, you can go off of the chargeback date. If you would prefer to view it on, of all the transactions I did this year, how many of them were charged back, then you can go off of the original invoice date. And if you just want to go off of journal number and say, what was the total value of chargebacks, quantity, and value of a specific journal or journals, uh, you can go by journal. So you've got a lot of flexibility in pulling the chargeback numbers. So the next thing I want to go into um, is employee commissions. So employee commissions are very hot topic lately. We are constantly being asked, um, you know, how others are doing it, what's working, what's not working. We've got workarounds to, um, you know, make it work with our chargeback uh, module today, or the refunds and the pennies. So on the employee commissions, a couple things I want to point out. First is the commission widget. It's very basic. 
A lot of people don't use it, unfortunately. It's a widget that's on the home screen that's just filling in in real time how much commission the employee's earning. And in case anyone doesn't know, this is a widget you can actually lock on the home screen so that it's forced to be there every single time that an employee goes into the phone active, or I'm sorry, just into RQ4. The second thing is the commission ledger. So in case anyone doesn't know what the commission ledger is, this is a tool where you can manually give someone commission. So if you need to manually give someone commission for either a bonus or you had something set up wrong and you're fixing it, instead of refunding and reselling all the time, you can always manually give them commission. And when you're manually giving someone commission, you can either just give them a lump sum and say, here's $300, or you can tie it to a specific invoice, product SKU, and tracking number if that makes sense. And when you link it to an invoice or product, when you charge it back or you refund it, this manual commission will come back as well. The last thing with the commission ledger uh, is that you can take an Excel sheet and import it in here. So if anyone calculates any bonuses outside of the system and you know that these employees should get this much bonus, instead of manually adding that to their paycheck um, or manually adding it one by one in here, just take the Excel sheet and import it in here. The only thing that needs to match is first name, last name. So that should be pretty easy because most people who calculate anything outside the system are using one of our reports to begin with. So it's really fast to get information back into RQ4 so that the employee always has the visibility on the home screen as to what their commission truly is, including all of those bonuses and anything like that. So the what if widget, this was something Ken mentioned um, in the keynote this morning. So I just wanted to go into a little bit more detail. The what if widget came to be because we were talking to a lot of people who uh, had employees who if they wanted, if they were interacting with a customer and the customer said, what's the price of this phone if um, I do it on a two year versus a one year or an upgrade? Um, or maybe I want to know what's the total of my invoice gonna be if I add this accessory and this one, whatever it may be. We originally started doing the what if widget to be a price to the customer check, a really quick way for the employee to just add some stuff and say, here's how much it is, Mr. Customer, it's gonna be this much. But then we were thinking, wouldn't it be great if we could estimate the commission that the employee was gonna get based on that? So then it became the what if widget that was gonna do both. It was gonna show you how much it's gonna be to the customer, and it's gonna show you how much commission you're gonna earn. So the employee can choose here uh, a term, a rate plan, a phone, if you can't see it in the screenshot because it is dark, um, there is an accessory tab and a feature tab. So I can add accessories on here, I can put features on here, and as I add features and accessories, uh, my commission will grow and it will say, here's how much commission you'd make if you sold this. So the intention is that you know when employees have downtime, instead of just poking around in places in RQ4 that they don't really aren't getting any value out of, at least they can find the right combination of things here, and if you're paying a percentage of gross profit that are gonna make you more money, that will make them more money. So that's why we called it the what if widget. What if I sold this with this? The next thing is the milestones that uh, Chris showed earlier this morning. So how the milestones will work, if they're enabled on your database, is the employee will have their set uh, milestone reward set up. So you can have up to five showing on this home screen, and all five can have a different milestone. So some might be quantity based, some might be sales based, some might be gross profit based, but I as an employee can see on one screen where I'm at as far as my milestone for um, each different group. So when they click on it, they'll get more details, you know, you've got this many to go, um, here's where you're at, and you, it just visualizes in a fun way for the employee to see exactly where they're at. So specifically how that's gonna work is through this milestone setup, but what I really like about it is because it's so flexible to be a prize, um, where you can just manually type in, if you sell this much profit, or this quantity of activations, or you're this contest, I mean, whatever it is that you want, if it's a prize and you're giving away a $100 you know, cash card or whatever that might be, when the employee tenders a sale, it actually pop, pops up and says, congratulations, you just achieved milestone uh, A and you got your $100 cash card. 
but you can also use it for bigger things because it can be sales or profit based. So you could do, um, you know, if you hit this much sales, you get an extra $200 or whatever it might be. So it's not tiered commissioning at all, but it is definitely an automated bonus system where we're really trying to incent staff to hit their targets and meet their milestones along the way so that they get these extra pieces of commission. So, you know, one thing that we get asked all the time is how to pick a comp plan. So, how do comp plans work? How do I pick the right comp plan? So, I think the first thing uh, is that, you know, employees will always figure out how to make money fast and faster than you. And especially when we have our new what if widget and we're giving people tools to figure out what combination of things they need to sell to make more money. They're going to figure it out, and they're going to figure it out really fast. We need to give them a good base uh, to, or a good opportunity to make sure that they make money. So if they have a good opportunity to make money, the more they make, the more you make. It's obviously wonderful. And then you always have to ask yourself um, if you'd work for your own comp plan. If things didn't work out for you today and you weren't in the position that you were, would you turn around and would you be proud to work for your own comp plan? So if you are, and if you would, then that obviously means I think that you would have a much better comp plan versus if you say to yourself, oh no, I would never work for my comp plan, what, kind of, what is that saying to our employees, right? So how good can it be if we would never do it ourselves? So um, one thing that I think is really cool about what we're going to do today is look into some specific dealers comp plans and see exactly how people are paying out there. So that's something a lot of people ask is how are other people paying? How do I find my right percent? What other percentage are people paying? How do they do their bonuses? What qualifiers do they have? So I have a few examples that we're going to go over here specifically. So the first example we're going to talk about is Cellcom Wireless. Cellcom has 55 Rogers stores across Canada, and they're all the way across, they're nationwide. Now, what's unique about Cellcom is they recently acquired Wireless Evolution, and they gained 30, location, 30 Sprint locations in the US. So this customer has a unique perspective because they have Canadian stores, and they have American stores now, and they're really trying, and, and I mean, you couldn't be more different as far as comp plans go with Canadian dealers and American dealers. So they've really had to um, figure out what works best for them in commission. They've had their current commission plan since 1995, and now this blows my mind because they haven't changed their comp plan in Canada since 1995 because they believe so strongly in it and they, it's worked out so well for them that they feel that they've had it right the whole time. So here's how their comp plan works exactly. So in Canada, they get a monthly salary of either 1,600 or 2,000, depending on if you're a sales rep or a manager, and then you get either 25 or 30% gross profit. And again, 25 if you're a sales rep, 30% if you're a manager, and it's either or, whichever is highest. So that's pretty much the end of their comp plan. It's very straightforward. You get a percent or you get your salary. The only extra addition that they have to it is a potential volume bonus. They set targets. If you meet all of your targets, you get an extra $400. It's not an extra percent. It's a lump sum payment. So you're in control of your percentage across gross profit, and then you have the potential of this $400 lump sum. Here's how they pay in the US. They get the hourly wage, and that's dependent on the state that the store is in, and then 25% of gross profit. So similar to their Canadian comp plan. What's different about their American and Canadian comp plan is they've got two different volume bonuses or extra bonuses that you could get. The first is the same one. You meet your targets, you, get, you, you meet your quantity targets, and you get $400 lump sum. And if you meet your gross profit bonus and targets, you get an extra 400. So in the US, it's a little different. So you get your, you, your basic 25% and then the potential of 800 more. So the next customer is Express Locations. They have 80 T-Mobile stores uh, in multiple markets across the country. 
and they've had their current comp plan for four and a half years. So express locations, they pay an hourly wage plus a growth, tiered gross profit. So their tiers are 4%, 6 8 10 or 12%. And it's a different percentage based on the amount of gross profit you make. So if you do tier A, you get 4%, tier B is 6%, and so on. So they have different tiers with different percentages, and their gross profit at this point, a max of 12%. If you meet, then, your gross profit per op target, you get an extra 3% of your overall gross profit. So that brings us, let's say we're at the highest, we're at 12, now we're at 15. If you meet your op target, you get an extra 3%. Now we're at 18. So again, I hit my highest gross profit tier, that gets me to 12%. I hit my gross profit per op, that gets me to 15. My op target gets me to 18. Now they have their ops accelerator and decelerator. So hopefully I can explain this right. So uh, depending on um, how much you make with your uh, operations percent, or your opportunities percent, excuse me, um, you might have 25% taken out if you don't meet your target. So if you do zero to 75%, you get 25% of your commission taken out. If you meet 75 to 125% of your ops target, you get that amount plus potentially 25%. If you got 100, you'd get the 25% bonus. And if you get over 125% of your goal, you get your full, your full commission percentage, whatever level you made, plus your 25% bonus. So the next example we're gonna go over is T-squared cellular. They have 18 Verizon locations, and their comp plan works like this. You get 24% profit on your new activations and upgrades, and you get 24% profit on your accessories and their handset protection plan through ProtectCell. So there's straight 24% across the board. So in addition to that 24%, what they do is they say you get 2% bonus for every KPI that you achieve. So we're gonna set our five KPIs. For every single one that you achieve, you get an extra 2%. And then, if you meet all five KPIs, you get an extra 2%, okay? So all very different comp plans, but the underlying theme is they all are percentages. Uh, we surveyed our, all of our customers a while back, and we found that 70% of our customers are paying percentage of gross profit. Uh, SPIFs are, pretty much non-existent uh, with our customers anymore, and less and less are going away from gross profit, or I'm sorry, from SPIFs, and they're all moving towards gross profit. Um, but with that being said, um, I'm actually going to get the customers that I talked about today to come up, and we are going to uh, allow you to ask them specific questions on their specific comp plans. So this is Lori from Express. Uh, she's the 78 location where I probably butchered her accelerator, decelerator, sorry. Um, does anyone have any questions? We're using our base tier, and that's what we're building into the commissions portion of every product skew on percentage of margin. And then we're calculating any additional tiers that, or ladder rungs that they are achieving and any of the accelerators, they were the green boxes that Stacy had had on her mm -hmm. slide. We're using those and importing them into the commission ledger. We, we report on it every day, but we don't report on their actual commission earnings. If they know what benchmarks that they've achieved, you can easily calculate your commissions by percentage of profit if you know what profit you're at for the month question, if anyone didn't hear, is the question is how is she handling chargebacks uh, if she's using um, RQ4 to track the base percentage at, you know, one amount, and then when you're charging back later on, if you're charging back at different amounts, how are you making sure that it's charging back at the right amount? We charge back at the first rung of the ladder. We, outside, inside the system, as we're doing our refunds, <laughs> for items that we're not able to dispute, or we're doing adjustments to the prior month's activations, or occasionally this month's activations, 
we calculate an adjustment percentage of their total GP, and if their adjustment percentage goes above a certain level, they're ineligible for any contests or daily raffles that we have. Um, we have monthly contests, annual contests. Uh, I'm trying to think. So that's, that's their um, incentive to avoid chargebacks. Uh, but the question is, uh, do you share the gross profit reports with the employees uh, down to every product level to, so that they can see what the gross profit is that they're making? Yeah. Do you share that? Absolutely. The gross profit model is completely open to all of the employees. All the systems are transparent. Um, that way they can make a better decisions on whether it's a profitable sale or a non-profitable sale. And when they can make commissions on the profitable sales, they're more likely to make those decisions. Well, thank you guys so much.